So we finally made it. And uh, so, okay, coming back to this cartoon. This is a representation of a block uh, that we all see every day. And what's a landing zone? A landing zone is an edge of a critical lesion with a block burden of less than 40%. And that's the most important number that we need to remember when we're finding a landing zone. In this particular case, a landing zone is not a line, it's a band of three or four millimeters where we need to find whether we can actually place a stent. And once we define it, we realize that the luminal area, the luminal diameter at the landing zone is three millimeters. And so the reference vessel area, that is the target, is 7.1. Proximally, this happens to be a 3.5 millimeter luminal diameter, which makes that reference vessel diameter 9.5 millimeters squared. Naturally, when we have our two landing zones determined, it's very easy to get our endpoints. And this is what I talk about getting an endpoint before you start a case. What are those endpoints? And we will figure that out. First of all, we know that we could use any stent between 26 and 30 because some labs would have a 26, some would have a 28, some would have a 30 millimeter in a particular brand and in a particular size. So that's why landing zones have to be bands and not aligned. Once we realize this, we know that the distal part of this stent will have to be expanded in relationship to the reference vessel distal to it, which happens to be 3. So all the blue shadow will have to be 7.1 millimeter square or in the thereabouts. And proximally, it will have to be 9.5 because it's a 3.5 vessel. Having said that, now the sizing. If you size it to the distal, distal branch, then the size is constant. It's 3O. And believe you me, size is not important. The size of the stain that we put off from the shelf is not important. Because in this patient, some people would have said, Jay has chosen a 2.5, I chose a 3, and if you choose a 3, 2, 5, it doesn't make a difference as long as you deploy it safely. What is important is what you make out of this stent after you've deployed it and how much you expand it and that's what is your expected MSA. Even though the size through the length is the same, the expected MSAs for different segments in that RG will be different. So in the distal part will be 7.1, in the proximal will be 9.5. And therefore, under expansion is defined to anything less than 7.5 proximally and less than 5.5 distal. Having set these rules, now we can go to applying it in the context of anything. So let's apply it in the left main PCI. In the left main PCI, the most important thing that we need to figure out is the second branch. Because the second branch decides the strategy. And believe you me, I'm not calling it a side branch because both the branches are main. Circumflex and LED are both very important branches and therefore it is one branch and the other. The results of the PCI are important and we need to now move away from an angiographically good result to an iris good result. And we need to assess our failures. So the key elements in a single state strategy is right in this cartoon. And this red box defines what is going to happen to the second stent, whether it's going to happen or not. And when you do an iris measurement of the circumflex artery, remember, it is not possible to get a transactional view because of the wire bias. You will get oblique views. And therefore, when you want to size the circumflex artery, it is not best to size at the ostium because you'll get a longitudinal view. You need to go three millimeters or four millimeters into the circumflex and measure your reference vessel size because this is going to determine the size of your final MSA that you have to achieve. Now, having said that, the IVIS runs in both these branches are important. I see a lot of people just doing IVIS run in the main branch and not doing the second branch. The second branch is far more important than the main branch. So, having said that, let's go to a case. This is a left main. And when I look at the left main, it's a distal left main. It looks like the surface might be involved in that left main. The lesion extends into the LED much beyond. And so when I look at the landing zone in the LED, it represents a luminal diameter of 3 or 3.1, which puts your MSA target distally at 7.3. And proximally, 
the disease extends to the ostium of the left vein, so you have to stretch your stem on the way to the ostium, and this is the largest artery. And in between, it's all soft plug, which is good. So we know that the stent length is going to be from this point to here, which is 50, 51 millimeters. So you know any one stent is not going to do the job. And the diameter will have to move from 5 millimeters to 3 millimeters. So you need to now make a diagrammatic fashion kind of a statement in your head as to how you're going to divide your stent, your stents. This is where the branches come into play. This is your circumflex and this is your diagonal branch. You should plan your stents in such a way that if you're going to overlap these two stents, it's best not to have the overlap segment across a branch because you will very likely occlude it or make it very difficult for you to enter it in case you compromise it. So in this case, we chose to land our first stent, which is the bigger stent, just short of the diagonal, overlap it and then extend the second stent distally, which is a 3 -oh. Now, even if we take whatever stent we take, we will need to dilate, we need to dilate this segment. This will be your first spot, and we define it and we'll figure out what size that is. But we will require to do an additional part of the left main, so you'll require a second larger balloon for the left main. And you'll require the third for the distal LED or the middle LED. Why is this drawing board concept extending into the cath lab important? Because this reduces mortality and this has been proven in our paper. Do I have two minutes to complete your slide? Great. So this paper showed that when you plan a case like this and determine your endpoints, before you engage into the left wing, you're going to reduce mortality and make your life simpler. Having said that, Let's go back to our case. So here, the most important question was, what is our circumflex look like? Our circumflex ostium is here. And it shows that there's a plaque burden of less than 50%. It's an MLA of 8.5 and no plaque at the carina. The carina is right over here because this is the LED here. It's a thin carina. Which means that this is going to be a very forgiving circumflex and it is going to be okay to do a single stem strategy and you won't need a two stem strategy here. So we did just that. We put in two stems just like I showed in my diagram, a bigger stem proximally or a smaller stem distally, optimized it. And what do I find? I find that distally, we needed 7.3, we achieved 8. Very good. At the ostium of the LED, it's 11.6. But at the confluence, it's around 8.9 and here it's 14. Something doesn't make sense. And what doesn't make sense? One, there is a lot of malaposition in the left wing that needs to be corrected immediately. And two, these numbers don't make sense because 8.1, 11.5 and then a reduction of MSA and then a, there is something not expanded very well. And this tells you, when you look at it in this fashion, you realize that this is an incomplete pot or what I call a defensive pot. That means the marker is not gone distant enough and you've not gone hard enough on that area to have a complete stretch. So how do we correct it? The first thing we do once we put the stents in is optimize the left main portion of the stent. This is the most crucial step because a floating stent can get deformed, but a velopo stent is very unlikely to be deformed. So the first thing you do once you plant the stent in the left main is you optimize it with a pot. So we did that with a fiber balloon and put it to the left main. And the second thing is to achieve an expansion everywhere. So we expanded this with a higher pressure and got it to 12.6. And now 8.1, 11.6, 12.6 and 14, they have the right flow. That means that's the rightly tapered artery that we've achieved. And this is optimization for the left main with a single stem strategy. When you use provisional and when you use a planned two-step strategy, most of us can look at an angiogram and say this will require two steps. You don't need IMAs to determine two-step strategy. So a planned step, once you know that you're going to have two steps, all you need to do is plan your angioplasty based on the IMAs. But when you have a provisional strategy, you do an IMAs and sometimes, based on the IMAs, you say no, this is not possible, we have to have two steps. So one I mean, there are many such examples. So, this is one example where we had a left pin, which is 1, 1, 1. And we did a rotoblader, advanced the rotoblader, and then did a cutting balloon. The ostium of the circumflex was soft, was very, very discreet. 
So all we did was a cutting balloon in the left brain and a cutting balloon in the osteoporosis legs and still got away with a provisional state. We have similar cases here, but what we realize is that when the osteo of the circumflex or the branch or the second branch has these findings, a plaque burden less than 50%, an MLA more than 5.5, plaque is away from the carina, and it's a soft plaque which is less than 5 millimeters, we can get away with a single stent alone in these people. And I'm going to just show one more case to kind of conclude this because this could be a long talk, but I'm going to just show one to add to what I'm trying to say. In this patient, we thought that we could get away with a single stain from left plane to circumflex after doing a rotational arthritomy. But when we did an iris from the circumflex back after rotoblader, this is what we found. This is the circumflex osteum and this is the LED. You can see that the carina is thick. And opposite the carina is an excessive plaque in the circumflex which is calcified. Now, if I have to think of a landing my circumflex is 3.5 millimeters and if I were to take even a 3 millimeter balloon here and expand it, you can see that this will push that carina into the LED. Now if the LED is 4.6 to start with and if the carina gets pushed into the LED, this becomes a serious compromise. So when you see both the branches and when you have this kind of an interrelationship established, you know that you have converted from a single stain strategy originally to a planned two stain strategy to conclude the case. I'm going to stop here and take questions if there's any, but uh, there are so many more exciting areas where in intravascular ultrasound or imaging has completely changed the way we do or the way we practice and the way we do our angioplasties. Thank you for your listening.